Uh, and uh, before we get to anything more serious, I'm going to ask you, you're now in New Jersey, right? Because the yes. last time we talked, you were in Calgary. Yes. So you want me to speak about that transition from one place to another? Uh, not necessarily, but you can say what, 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 at what position are you now? What, what did you have? And sure. yeah, maybe how did you feel about this transition in general? Well, um, I was interested in, uh, in uh, leading a school. Uh, and then this opportunity presented uh, itself, um, mm -hmm. and I was um, chosen to become the next dean mm -hmm. of the Hillier College of Architecture and Design at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. So I uh, uh, took this opportunity up. Uh, it comes with certain challenges, uh, just like uh, all of the kind of leadership positions do. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the past uh, uh, year, uh, and a half, um, I have been, almost a year and a half, I have been busy working with my colleagues to uh, expand our programmatic offerings, uh, see how we can improve, you know, what we uh, offer now, uh, what are we need, a kind of a redirection uh, of, of our uh, efforts in, in, mm -hmm. in any way. Uh, and so far, you know, the, the, the journey has been uh, very, uh, very rewarding. Uh, what has prompted, let me just, just, just want to add something else. What kind of prompted this shift, uh, you know, from somebody who was engaged in research and scholarly work is some of the kind of voluntary work that I did in various organizations. So I served on the board of Acadia Association for Computer Aided Design and Architecture. That was early in my career. Then I uh, was elected president of that organization. Then after I became associate dean in Calgary, I ended up uh, involved in an organization called Canadian Council of University Schools of Architecture. And then I was nominated by my colleagues to serve on the Canadian Architectural Certification Board mm -hmm. that actually deals with the accreditation uh -huh. and certification of architecture graduates in Canada. And then on that board, I was elected president of that board. <laughs> so then I, I kind of started to, to enjoy uh, these uh, positions that enable one to uh, uh, effect change. Yeah. And then lastly, I, and for that reason, I, I ran in the elections for the president of the Association of the Collegiate Schools of Architecture, which brings schools in North America mm -hmm. together in Canada, in the U.S., and we have international members. And I was uh, um, elected to that role, <laughs> uh, served uh, for four years on the board, uh, first as second vice president and first vice president and president and past president. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and again, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting uh, uh, dimension of, of academic engagement mm -hmm. where one actually get to shape, design uh, programs, curricula, again, working while working with, uh, with, uh, with, with others. It's a collective, collect, mm -hmm. collective effort. And yeah. I enjoy doing it. So a very, inter very interesting CV when, when one would look at it, it's just president, 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 mm -hmm. vice president, president. <laughs> no, it's not it's actually what I, what I list first is, 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 is my academic positions, academic experience, because mm -hmm. first and foremost, that's who I am. So mm -hmm. I, I'm in academia, I, I teach, I don't teach at the moment, but I will teach again as a, as a, as a dean. So. Mm -hmm. I do research and I do scholarly work again, not at the moment because, you know, I've, I've just started as a, as a dean and I have my hands busy with, with all sorts of, with all sorts of things. That, so, that's, a, that's a relatively new position, right? Um, it's a new position for me, yeah, again, yeah, that, I, that right. I'm in a, in, in, a, in a position of a dean of, mm -hmm. the, of, the, of the college. So, mm -hmm. but prior to that, I served in Calgary as associate dean, so I got a taste of yeah. administration mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, in the past, I had you know different different mm -hmm. administrative positions. I was mm -hmm. involved in the various committees and so on. But 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 again, you know, it's um, it's 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 something that I enjoy doing. Yeah, cool. I mean, I I'm sure we're gonna touch upon some aspects of your working there and about the school mm -hmm. itself. But I wrote to you. I wanted to start the start the conversation with this core subject that I want to, to go through it as much as I can. And that is basically the value of a trained architect, which is one of the things that you have to deal with, I'm sure, as a dean. And uh, I generally don't want to dwell now into some statistics, but uh, I might pull some up on the screen in post-processing. 
but generally in Europe, I mean, it's a kind of a known fact that architects are among the least paid profession with a faculty degree. And I even saw some lists uh, for Germany where they were actually the last spot. So I had certain thoughts about this. And in my videos, uh, I covered some of that and in different conversations, including with some partners in very large and successful architectural offices, I could often hear how even Ivy League educated architects first have trouble finding work. And then even when they do, they actually become draftsmen for, for years to come and so on. And uh, for, for me, I mean, uh, the, the obvious is kind of pretty, pretty uh, the, the answer is kind of pretty obvious that the, the supply is larger than the demand probably. And that's kind of the, maybe one of the, the, the aspects. But uh, first of all, I wanted to ask you, what do you think? Uh, do you think that is the case that the supply is larger than the demand? And uh, uh, if, if that's not the only reason, maybe we can discuss further uh, to, to, to see what. I happen to have a bit of an insight in, in, in how all of that works. Um, so when I was involved with the CACB, the Canadian Architectural Certification Board, I got to, to learn um, about the, the numbers of young people who graduate you know, from the schools of architecture, then how many of them uh, then complete uh, the internship program, and then how many of them later uh, become, become licensed. And then concern at the time, and this is um, early in, in this de decade, so we're talking about 2011, 2012. The concern in Canada and, and much of the US is that we are not going to have enough architects in the future. So as, uh, as the, the, the uh, population grows, uh, so should the, the number of architects increase. And in response to this perceived uh, lack of, of uh, graduates in the, in the future and people in the profession as licensed uh, architects, uh, both US and Canada uh, decided to launch something called the Broadly Experienced uh, Foreign Architect Program. So where uh, individuals uh, with degrees you know, from overseas who have had, I think, a minimum of seven years of practice could apply to become licensed in the US. Okay. So there was a formal application process where their education credentials are evaluated first, uh, then their portfolio of professional work is evaluated next, then there is a fee to pay for all of that. So it takes, takes time you know, for someone to become then a licensed professional in one of these mm -hmm. two countries. So the perception at least in Canada and the US is that we uh, will not have uh, again, a sufficient number of, of, of graduates moving forward. Mm -hmm. And um, I haven't actually checked before um, you and I met, I wanted to, but I think the, the number of people who graduate you know, from uh, US architecture programs is slightly above 5,000 a year. Okay. So there is you know, 130 uh, accredited programs in the US and, 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 and Canada. So these 130 programs, again, graduate over what, 5,000 uh, people, uh, people a year. Uh, and then if you think of the population of the US and Canada, you know, 340 you know, million in the US or so, uh, 10 times smaller population in, 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 in Canada. So it's not enough, so mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, in, in both countries. And I think there is less than 100,000 licensed architects in, in the US alone. I think the number is close to 70,000 or so. Mm -hmm. So these numbers are not huge by, uh, by any, any measure. So I you know, would not necessarily agree with your view mm -hmm. that there is a, an oversupply in architects of, of, of architects. There might be in certain countries in, in, in Europe, mm -hmm. but I don't think that's the case in, in, in North America. And, and what, what would be the, the metrics to, to measure if it's enough or not? I mean, is there something, uh, something exact? Because uh, I, I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing uh, doing it by the feeling is, is really hard. Usually one has to look at the market and see yes. how much, how many uh, exact the market is. I remember seeing these numbers uh, at some point over the, the, the past decade, early in, in, in this decade, as I said, and, and there were statistics as to how many architects per head in the US and how many architects per head in mm -hmm. Canada and then in other parts, parts of the world. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think the US uh, and Canada happen to have a kind of lowest, or not lowest, I should say one of the lower ratios uh, uh -huh. among, uh, among the, the developed, uh, developed countries. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that has to do with the culture of building. Mm -hmm. So, you know, much of the, of the, of the, of the building in, in the US and Canada, talk about uh, residential homes, uh, is handled by the developers. Uh, so these people do not need builders. They do not need to have a licensed architect, you know, work with them to get the, yeah. get the approvals. And the regulations vary enormously, you know, from, yeah. from state, to, uh, state to state to state, as you may know. And in Europe, there are similar, you know, huge differences, you know, between different countries in the European Union yeah. and what the, what, the, what the rules are as to for what kind of a project you need to have an architect, you know, as somebody who uh, submits the drawings, you know, for, uh, for permits and, and so on. Yeah, that is, that is my general feeling without knowing the exact statistics and exact numbers mm -hmm. is that the architects are somehow needed less and less. And if the logic behind that is that someone is taking their jobs, right? So it's probably a, developers in, in a large way, maybe civil engineers and so on. So I wanted to uh, ask you if you think that as, as we go into this age of automation and so on, I mean, uh, do you think that, that the more is taken from the, from the architect if we continue to educate them in a classical way and if the curriculum has to change to adapt to the times and how it should change? Because uh, let me simplify the question. If we teach architects the same things we taught them in the last 50 years, maybe there will be less and less and less work for them because the world is becoming a uh, more complex, different software is used, programming is used, and then the different professions are grabbing little pieces of, of what architects used to do and uh, little is left. Do you see it in a similar way or, or no? Well, I, I expect that uh, uh, changes will have to take place in, in architectural uh, academia, in, not just in architectural academia, in academia in general, in response to what's transpiring outside of our walls. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, there is an increasing degree of multidisciplinary collaboration uh, in the in the profession with new workflows uh, being invented um, and this this kind of new workflows and specifically I'm referring to collaborations between architects uh, engineers fabricators and contractors these workflows have yet to find uh, a, a parallel in, in in academia so it's very rare to find architecture programs that have very good collaborative relationships, let's say with the engineering disciplines, construction management programs and, and, and so on. So I expect that such collaborations will begin to emerge, especially now that accreditation requirements, for example, in the United States uh, have been changed dramatically. So there is a set of um, expectations that is known as student performance criteria that accreditation uh, conditions define. And that has resulted in a kind of certain standardization of what architectural curricula uh, look like. So if one were to look at say at the curriculum of the school at Princeton or a school in Kansas City, for example, there will be great degree of similarity between the two in terms of what is being taught and mm -hmm the subjects that are being covered and, and, and so on. So what the accreditation board did is decided to, to reduce this criteria to an absolute uh, minimum in order to enable uh, schools to start innovating in how they teach. So there was a, a concern that we had ways of teaching prescribed by the uh, accreditation uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. So with that gone, I think we will uh, uh, see a considerable degree of innovation mm -hmm. in the coming decade, especially again in, in the U.S. What worries me a little bit is that other countries you know, have started to copy what the U.S. is doing. Uh, and Canada and U.S. irrigation systems are very similar. So, so uh, I do know that certain countries in Europe were interested in what the U.S. was doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, in other parts of the world, especially large countries mm -hmm. that are very diverse in terms of climactic regions, uh, building practices, and, yeah. and, and so on. So 
So I'm optimistic when mm-hmm. it comes to the ability of, of uh, the schools to, to adapt because again, the context in which we function has changed. And then the context in which we frame what we do is also changing as I, as mm-hmm. I said, the accreditation standards being, uh, being one of them. Well, yes, the, the, one of the most important aspects you, uh, that you mentioned of the, is the collaboration because that's one of the biggest problems in the industry mm-hmm. today. It's this siloed, uh, a, a siloed uh, development of, of projects where the communication between architects, and engineers, MEP engineers, and so on is not, uh, is not working well. And that's what uh, a lot of people, including us, uh, are trying to solve by moving everything to the cloud, moving everything to different platforms and uh, and uh, collaborating in a in a in a much more tight way, especially with the, with the, with the coronavirus. And um, I wanted, yeah, that's a, a great idea to implement that more during the studies because that's definitely needed. And uh, when we're on the subject of curriculum, uh, you know that I've been doing this uh, programming in architecture since mm-hmm. uh, since ten years and so mm-hmm. on. And um, when when I was starting, I kind of imagined we will see a really big proliferation of it. And uh, in in my mind, it has not been as big as I expected. So uh, just a, just a short question about: Do you think that that's introduced that part of architecture, this parametric design, computational design, call it however you want, programming in architecture? Mm-hmm. Do you think that that is introduced enough into the universities? Do you think it should be pushed more or maybe left to some uh, other professions or what's your general attitude about that programming for architects, which is generally a new thing, right? Architects never really had to learn how to code until 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, let me just go back to to what we discussed um, uh, previously about the kind of disciplinary silos. Mm-hmm. Um, that's certainly an impediment, but I think a bigger impediment is the kind of the different pedagogies that exist in, in architecture and let's say in some of the engineering disciplines. Like uh, the engineering schools, you know, do not have the equivalent of a design studio that, that we have. Uh, the, the methods that are being taught in those schools are often linear. So it's like you do step A, then you do step B, then step C, and, and so on. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, design doesn't unfold in a linear fashion. And I can speak from experience, you know, where uh, at some point in my career, I wanted to collaborate with a civil engineering program. Um, and we did get the two groups to work together. So there was a special course that was created for the civil engineering students. Uh, and then they had to kind of help, you know, determine the sizes of the structural members. So they did that and they thought they were done. So then the architecture students, you know, changed the project and then the the structural system changed and the members sizes had to be changed and their counterparts in civil engineering were not amused. It's Mm -hmm. like, you mean we have to do everything again? (laughs) And the answer was yes. And that had to, had to happen again and again. And then in the kind of debriefing at the end of the journey, the engineering students were thinking that, you know, that what we were doing as designers is absolutely crazy, like a complete waste of time from, 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 from their perspective. Yes. And then from our perspective, it's an absolute necessity to kind of continue refining the, the, the project. So, so there is this big chasm uh, in, in education, you know, between, between the disciplines that I think at some point would have to be bridged mm-hmm. uh, uh, somehow. Which then brings me to the subject that, that, you, that you brought up. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is now an increasing interest in performance uh, in buildings. Um, that is, um, you know, on one side, social, cultural um, performance of, of, of buildings, financial performance of buildings, which is what clients care about, yeah. to the kind of technical performances that are the realm of, 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 of engineering. So increasingly, we need to demonstrate to, to uh, government, to permitting authorities that we have energy efficiency in our buildings. Yeah. Uh, we need to uh, uh, demonstrate that we have you know, healthy air flows in the buildings. We need to demonstrate that we have natural ventilation in the buildings, uh, working well with, with artificial uh, ventilation. So, so 
I shouldn't call it artificial ventilation, it's mechanical systems. So, 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 so that has, that has kind of um, brought together these disciplines mm -hmm. to kind of look at potential solutions. And I, and I think where parametrics, you know, come into, into play is in attuning buildings to the kind of particular local uh, circumstances. So in other words, the difference becomes not a whim of the kind of aesthetic preferences, mm -hmm. but the difference um, becomes mandated by the desire to reduce the amount of steel that is used in the building or the amount of concrete that is being poured so that not every column is exactly the same and not every yeah. beam is exactly the same. So, so, so that gives parametrics a rationale. Mm -hmm. In other words, there, there is a reason why then one pursues difference in, in, in the project that is again tied to some kind of measurable, measurable uh, outcome. Yeah, I mean, for me, parametrics is, as, as you said, is basically optimization and it's uh, optimization in a new way because when we optimized 50 years ago, 100 years ago, that means that meant modularity. That means we want as many elements the same as we can get and that's how we optimize, right? And that's how it's cheaper. But today, theoretically, with CNC machines, we don't care about elements being different anymore so we can now go deeper into the optimization and actually uh, optimize every element. And... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree actually that the, this parametrics brings brings uh, uh, professionals together because I saw a lot of lot of serial engineers using actually Grasshopper and trying to connect it with architects and and uh, parameterization brings this automated loop in the design process that you were talking about because this loop is actually what's creating the problem. This going back and forth. So the more mm -hmm. we automate that uh, be, uh, between all all the players in the game. Uh, that will that will come so i will ask you a little bit more about uh, what you think generally about automation in our profession like it's coming as in as in every other profession and and how does that look but but before that i wanted to just dwell on this parametric thing uh, just a little bit because two three years ago i made a video where i kind of expressed uh, my thoughts about the parametric design or computational mm -hmm. design that it's actually a bit, uh, a bit deceiving to call it like that because I do not believe that almost, that, that almost anyone designs parametrically. I believe that people uh, or offices create design from their head on their sketch and so, so on and then use parametrics to execute that design. To design truly parametrically, which would mean to move sliders around to search for the form, search for the shape and so on. And to do that in a proper way, we need much more advanced algorithms. We need, we need some proper artificial intelligence to actually help us design parametrically. Do you see it uh, in a similar way? Do you see uh, that, that do, you, do you see it like, like that, like that we're not actually designing yet uh, parametrically, but just executing what we designed as well? Or do you see it differently? Well, uh... Uh, oftentimes, the, the uh, design uh, is generated first, and then the parametrics are brought in to, to let's say, deal with this element of difference, which is now um, attainable. And then because of the cyclical iterative nature of, of, of design, uh, automating, you know, some of the parts of the process, as you said, you know, makes perfect sense because then you, you know, reduce the, 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 the effort and the complexity of you know having to execute the same steps again uh, and 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 again, uh, and I, I uh, remember one of the the you know early lessons uh, I had as a graduate student is when I you know took the parametrics on. This was uh, thirty more than thirty years ago, <laughs> thirty five years ago, and and then that that uh, you know the, the Greek the Roman orders were actually parametric, so. We have a, a perfect <laughs> example of, of you know parametric design uh, being being defined as 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 the kind of succinct uh, formal definition of of, of architecture. Mm -hmm. And then I took a course. This was in, within the context of a course on on, on Palladio's architecture because mm -hmm. I became interested in it. And Palladio essentially had an algorithm how to to produce a, a, a villa. So yeah. so he essentially had a workflow. 
of how you would go about designing designing a, a, a villa. So when a design method is kind of well understood, and when the kind of formal outcomes are well understood, mm -hmm. then parametrics can be de deployed as being intrinsic yeah. to the to the process. Not something that will come from the outside, but it's actually something that can mm -hmm. come from from yeah. within the definition of the of yeah. the project's geometry. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, my beef generally is not with the, with the definition of yourself or the word or so, so on. My uh, uh, my concern was basically curriculums in this kind of computational design, parametric design courses, because very often they would turn to that side. They're, they would turn to try to move some sliders in order to design, which is extremely hard with the uh, algorithm we have today. And very often they would result in pretty pictures, but nothing that's relatable to the real world in, in, in architecture. And I thought that's a little bit of a waste of time and that the, generally how parametrics sh should be taught today is to apply them to automate stuff and not design yet because we don't have advanced enough algorithms to design. But maybe I'm wrong there because I, I heard a very a prominent professor one once in in our field and she said something like i will paraphrase it but she said something like we are not interested in doing anything that can be applicable to the market now we are basically trying to think about 10 15 20 years future uh, 20 years ahead fr from now and uh, in that sense that that maybe fits but what is generally your opinion about that attitude that that the universities uh, or uh, institutes when they do research, let's say in this field of programming and architecture, that they should concentrate on 10 years or now or 20 years from now and actually maybe do develop just pretty pictures that no one can uh, use at the moment, but maybe will in some way later, or do sh should they be more? Uh... I, have, I have less, less dramatic views of, of, of let's say, the, 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 the reality. And... And as somebody who has taught, you know, parametric design is you, uh, you, you first uh, introduce student, you know, students to the kind of canon of repetition. So why repetition, you know, came into existence, why we have grids and modules and so on, and what was the logic behind such a push mm -hmm. in, our, in our industry. Uh, and then you introduce parametrics as a kind of enabling technology for the exploration of difference. And then you begin to talk, you know, where difference becomes a kind of a desire, desirable quality in what is being, being designed. Mm -hmm. So that the students actually see how the two uh, apparently opposed models uh, uh, can coexist in, in some of the projects. So the repetition has its own logic, difference has its own, own logic. And just like we develop stylistic preferences, like each of us individually, we can also uh, develop preferences when it comes to the kind of logics of the project, you know, how the underlying geometry is to be developed and, and so on and, and so forth. So I'm perfectly fine to see a building that is kind of has a gridded repetitive uh, definition. Uh, and I'm interested in the logic behind it, like when I see it in a student project. And likewise, if I see a student, you know, pursuing difference for the sake of difference, Mm -hmm. You know, that is, you know, relatively vacuous. So I would like to see that difference being tied to, to something that uh, relates to how the building, re you know, addresses the, the surrounding public space mm -hmm. or how the building, you know, deals with the differing environmental conditions or with the kind of different, different you know, programmatic requirements mm -hmm. and, and so on. So uh, parametrics needs to be tied to logics of some yeah. sort. So. Yeah, well, I, I agree with that. That's that's also my point that uh, that the parametrics, when used, should have some some uh, some a reason good reason. To, yeah, reason to be used in, in the yeah. real world, not to be abstractly used uh, as uh, as in an art project per, per, per se. But uh, do you think that um, architect or, or master builder? It feels to me like. Maybe I'm wrong, but when we read from the history books, it feels like uh, the architect was always in the center of, of the project. And they, they were kind of the producer of the project. 
do you feel that, that the architects is still in the center or do you think they're pushed aside and then maybe developers or someone else is becoming this, this producer of the project and their, uh, architects have become just one, uh, one of the, the elements, one, one of the workforce uh, people that, that uh, somehow just uh, supply their, their way but not actually be the director of the project? Well, I think, you know, we're being recognized for what we bring to the projects. There is this, this uh, ability to synthesize very different bits of information um, together to produce, you know, something that the client uh, wants to see at the end, you know, which is the definition of the, of, of, of the building. Mm -hmm. And in that, you know, we rely on, on close relationship with the specialists. So the people, you know, who who have deep knowledge of certain realms, structures, mechanical systems, mm -hmm. uh, geology of the place. Yeah. Uh, and then depending on the, on, on the context, you know, we may have cultural consultants and, mm -hmm. and so yeah. on, you know, d depending on where the project is to be, is to mm -hmm. be uh, uh, located. So, but then I don't want to say that we kind of sit in, 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 in the center, but we, we again, brought in, because of our ability to synthesize from these very different threads of, mm -hmm. of, of, of information. Yeah. The people who, who oftentimes in many contexts have central law are project managers. So it's not necessarily the architects, but people whose job is to actually organize these yeah. groups to work together. Uh, and, including, and they, they a, including project management companies. Yes. So, so, so the, the, the clients, you know, hire them because of the, their capacity, again, to, to organize this relationships that need to exist between different parties and to kind of keep the group on, 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 on schedule as mm -hmm. to, you know, and focus on what the goals of the project, uh, project are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll tell you an anecdote. When I was in, I taught in Hong Kong in, in mid nineties, uh, and the, the, uh, the university of Hong Kong, it's a very good school of school of architecture. Uh, and to my surprise, you know, most of our students wanted to be project managers. So I was curious about that ambition and they told me the reason they want to do it is that it pays three times as much to be a project manager than to be, yeah. to be, to be an architect. So, and I actually don't see that as a problem. And I would like to see uh, architectural education uh, be uh, 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 a kind of an academic context that prepare people for all sorts of different career paths mm -hmm. so that some of us will end up as, as designers some of us will end up as project managers. Some of us will end up as real estate developers. Yeah. Some could even become politicians, you know, which I don't think is a bad outcome because that would help cities become better because what politicians can know a thing or two yeah. about the cities and, 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 and architecture. So, so um, I like the fact that we prepare people, you know, for, for a multitude of potential career paths in, 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 in most contexts, uh, architectural education is essentially reduced to about three years of professional education. So mm -hmm. uh, there are kind of general education courses that students need to complete in many, in, in many countries. And if you, if you think of the kind of the knowledge that can be imparted on, on required in, in three years, is really a fundamental nature. Yeah. So we want to make sure that our students understand the first principles. I'm sorry for this. I just have to... No Stop it. So understand the first principles, um, and then um, uh, they, they kind of understand the fundamentals, mm -hmm. uh, and then they go into the profession where they actually acquire the skills to that are kind of needed by a particular firm. Mm -hmm. And I kept stressing workflows, like you know the firms have very different workflows, mm -hmm. like as to how they execute projects. They would often in uh, kind of bring trained people, even with experience, to their way of way of working. So mm -hmm. I have to interrupt this phone call again. I'm sorry for the hmm. for the for the in, in, in interruption. No problem. So it's uh, it's um, it's a joint venture between okay. academia and practice. We jointly educate people who want to become licensed professionals. Yeah. And I think this, this kind of education in, in, in fundamentals mm -hmm. uh, equips uh, uh, graduates with essential critical skills to be successful in these career paths that they may, they may take. Do so you think we, that, that, that the students should be encouraged more to work while studying from the very beginning, for example? That's not for everyone. 
for example, in, in, in the US, the, the profession became concerned with a relatively low number of graduates you know, who choose to become licensed architects. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they saw as one of the impediments the average amount of time it takes for, for someone to, to travel from starting the school to getting a license, yeah. which currently takes about 12 years, uh, which is an incredibly yeah. long period of, 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 of time. So, and then one of the, the changes that the, the, the kind of licensing authorities proposed was to enable students to acquire experience while still in school, the hours for the experience that, are, that are kind of need to be accumulated. And then also to enable them to take elements of the licensing exam while still in school mm -hmm. with the goal of reducing the, the journey you know, from more than a decade to uh, say six years in the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. That's called IPEL, Integrated Path to Architectural Licensure. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's an option that is available in quite a few schools. And you know, we are one of the schools <clears throat> that will be interested in making that option available to our students. But our own state registration board in New Jersey or would actually have to accept that mm -hmm. as a possible path to becoming a licensed, licensed architect. But do you think that one of the reasons that <clears throat> that not so many architects uh, become licensed is that uh, they don't have to or they don't want to because they work in larger offices? Uh, I'm asking that because I I have this feeling that there is fewer and fewer offices and they're getting larger and larger. And I have mm -hmm. some friends working in some architectural offices here uh, in Vienna, uh, where we are now. And then I, I asked them, do you have licenses? And none of them had licenses. And they said, why they said, why would I need one? I mean, I work in an architectural office with, I don't know, 30, 35 people. And uh, whichever project we're working on, the bosses are signing. So theoretically, only the boss needs the license. And they said, why would you need a license? Only if you want to make your own office. Then I understand. But well, they, they were surprised, like, why, why else? So I'm asking you, why else? There is, a, there is an inherent contradiction <clears throat> in the system. So <clears throat> let's say if you were, if I'm a licensed architect and I'm the principal of the firm and I hire you to work in my, in my firm, it is not in my best interest uh, that you become licensed because then I could be creating a potential competitor down the road. Because once you become licensed, you can create your own firm. You can take away the clients that I introduced you to while you worked in my firm. And, and, and so on. So, so, you know, few in the profession would actually admit that this kind of inherent and contradiction, you know, does, uh, does, does exist. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the firms, to their credit, um, um, actually uh, offer incentives to their employees to become uh, licensed. So to them, that actually uh, matters because, you know, somebody who starts as an intern, you know, eventually could become a partner in the firm. And then for that person to become a partner, they should become licensed mm -hmm. along the way. So they could be one of the bosses signing the drawings. Mm -hmm. And then you may want to remind your friends, you know, that you just mentioned, you know, who have been working in the firms that circumstances change in people's lives. So it's like two decades from now, like someone who didn't think would need an artificial license, license would think about opening a firm. You could find yourself in a different city, different country, and then you would want to have your own, your own business. Mm -hmm. And then to think that late, that now I need to become licensed. Oh, I should have done that years ago and, 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 and so on. So my recommendation to people who are invested in practice, who are interested in architectural practice, is to become licensed. Yeah. So it's a... Well, I, 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 didn't, I didn't plan on, <laughs> on hanging on this subject, but I have uh, also uh, additional questions, which is, which is semi-personal. Uh, I'm not licensed. But oh, you should become licensed. I, I generally want to, you know, I, I, I generally wanted to, but here's my problem, you see. We talked about the, the branching of, of, of the mm -hmm. profession, and we, the branching means uh, people get focused on different areas. And we have specialists only for visualization. You have... Uh, people like me that only deal with programming and so on and so on. So in, uh, in Germany, for example, I, I think in Austria it's similar, I'll have to check. There is this nine phases of the construction project and in different countries there are different number of phases but they're usually the same. It goes from the design until the technical details, development technical details and so on until the execution of the project. Now if you look at what I do in the last 10 years, 
I've been basically programming and automating different parts of the building, optimizing and so on. That almost always fall in this very narrow phase five in Germany. So I have very little to none experience in phases one to four and six to nine. So when we educate at architects, we have we imagine this classical architectural work, which covers phases one to nine. But uh, very few of them actually go, go through that. Even the whole offices uh, in Germany just specialize in phases one to three, which is pure design. And some fa uh, specialize in phases six to nine, which is uh, paperwork and bringing it to the execution. So uh, in my case, it's just it's basically not a good question. It's a slight complaint. I would like to get a, a license, but in order to do that, it doesn't make sense. I would actually have to go... In, to a standard architectural office and work on a standard project in order to do that. So for us that are very specialized, but still in our field, there is no real solution. I mean, in, in that sense, there is no license for us. We are just left a little bit hanging. We're still working in architecture. I still work on very famous, very large scale architectural projects, just very focused on this middle part where we have to solve technical details, generate, generate, CNC files, steel sheets, uh, and so on and so on. So that's yeah. I don't know if you have a comment on that, but uh, that's just my, just my. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a one of those you know what if scenarios. So it's like, you know, where do you imagine yourself? You know, five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years yeah. from now. Yeah. So and then, you know, how do you you know make sure that you're not shortchanged down the road? Because you know the what you now what you're passionate about doing now is not necessarily going to be the same thing, mm -hmm. say five or 10 years from, from now. Just look back at your, mm -hmm. at your, at your journey. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you want to have as many options open as, uh, as, as possible. So, mm -hmm. and if that means, you know, working in, in an office, uh, you know, maybe you will find that refreshing again <laughs> at some point in your career when you will get tired of, of again, becoming so, mm -hmm. so specialized in, in, in what you do. I yeah. mean, what you do is great, uh, uh, but then you know you you then run the danger of, of becoming uh, uh, so so specialized yeah. that you kind of lose that ability to operate in in, in a kind of general general mm -hmm. way. Yeah, so that is always the it's, danger. It's I kind of went down that path in in at some point in my life, tried different things. I'll just give you an example. Um, in uh, this was early nineties. I was hired as a consultant, very much like you now, mm -hmm. to help the executive architect produce cross sections for uh, Frank Gehry's Disney concert hall. So, and they got a bunch of polylines in space mm -hmm. that, and they had to produce hundreds of, of these cross sections. Mm -hmm. And they, they asked me to, to write a program that would automatically give them the vertical lines that connect this kind of polylines they would define the planes and then yeah. they would automatically get the, the intersecting line. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a relatively easy, uh, easy, easy job. And then I you know, started doing more of those things. Uh, and some of them were interesting and some of them were boring. And I'm sure that in your case, you have interesting projects and have boring projects, but I, that, you know, became uninteresting, so to speak mm -hmm. down the road. And then yeah. I became interested in other things. And then I decided to get into academia. I really enjoyed teaching. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, got into research. And now I'm running a school. Yeah. And that's not how I imagined, you know, my, <laughs> my journey, you know, through, yeah. through, through life to, to unfold in, in, in that way. Yeah. Well, uh, luckily enough, I mean, the, the, the profession itself is changing very fast. So even if I do the same thing, it keeps being different <laughs> all the time. So even if I actually started doing similar things to what you just described, that moves on to different forms of static optimization. Now it's moving to machine learning and artificial intelligence and using game engines for visualization. And it's, it's basically changing all the time. So it, 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 there is always something more exciting on the horizon that you can strive to. And now it's especially uh, uh, machine learning and automation. Now, if, since I already mentioned that, but let's go back to the automation and maybe some thoughts on how automation uh, can change our industry. Because in our, in, in my mind, when I look at the architectural process, I, I see everything being uh, prone to automation. I, I see how everything could be easily automated 
And I am also of the opinion that even the design phase could, should not be, but could relatively easily uh, be uh, taken over by AI. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Well, I, I don't think that, that there are certainly certain things that can be uh, 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 automated and certain things that really do make sense to be automated. So uh, again, I'll offer example. I was hired as a consultant to work for, this was even back in Yugoslavia when it existed. This is mid eighties. Uh, there was a company that was designing pumping stations for the, uh, the, the uh, large uh, irrigation projects. And then each of these pumping stations had to be different because you know, the amount of water that was taken in, that was pumped out, the pressure of that water was varying, and then they would determine the machinery, the pumps they would need, that would give them the volume of the building and so on. And the way they dealt with that is that they had a kind of this drawing that had nothing to do with reality, with, with uh, uh, construction lines and, and dimensions and so on. Uh, and they would simply write in the numbers that they would <laughs> compute by hand but the drawing was not to scale in any, any way. So they hired me to automate the process. And we completely automated the process to the point where they would produce a complete set of construction drawings with everything that is needed to get the, the permits. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so that's a perfect example of a project that can be entirely uh, automated. So, and I would imagine and this is something, this, is, this was the, the latest project of mine in, involved in mass customization and housing, which I thought you know, would be now a norm, like where people would be buying a house that they would then customize for their own yeah. needs and things would flex and change and, on the screen. And they say, oh, that feels right. You know, that's, my, that's, my, uh, that's, that, that's my house. So I thought of that as being a perfect example you know, the, of something that can be automated. And then what one discovers and you think, you know, there will be a website so that somebody can go to a website yeah. and let's say you know, it's, it's, a, it's a Palladian villa. Let's say just to give you a ban you know, banal example, yeah. or, or neoclassical villa. And then you get to choose how many columns you want, you know, how big your portico is and the slant of your roof and how many rooms you want and, and so on. But then the people in general, you know, do not have confidence in their design abilities. So an average Joe would then to turn to one of us and ask, you know, do you think this looks good? Yeah. It's like, and then, so then that element of, of professional judgment, yeah. I think is still needed and will, will, will be deployed, you know, whether in a, in a public context, like the one that I mentioned, uh, or in the context of a large firm where you're working with your engineering colleagues, mm -hmm. And you know, let's say they're not as steeped in, in aesthetic judgments as, as we are. Yeah. So they will bring you in to kind of qualify what they're getting on, on the screen. Yeah, th that's what I, kind of what I meant with AI could take over, but it should not because it doesn't really make sense in that design phase. But in my mind, everything else is ki kind of prone to automation. And uh, in my mind, BIM, when trying to be defined, is nothing else but automation. It, BIM is just a move from 2D to immediately modeling in 3D and just uh, producing 2D. But let's, let's be semantically clear. I okay. mean, it's, you know, BIM, BIM is, as the, as the acronym suggests, is about, about building information modeling. So in other words, one construct an information model of, of the building that yeah. supposedly contains all the info that is necessary to, to design, build, and then operate, operate the building. Uh, uh, automation, would imply an, an, an automated production of such a model. So that, the last so, step. Yeah. yeah, so then you say, here is the site, uh, here is how much money I have, and this is the zoning envelope, and give me a good looking building. <laughs> and then your, your, the software would say, well, define good looking building. <laughs> and then you say, well, it would have to have, you have to somehow make it, make yeah. it. Explicit. Well, yeah, that would be a f full, full automation. But yeah, I, I just meant if we see these three phases, like the design and then the development, development. of the model, yeah, and then the there are certainly there are certainly aspects that, that yeah. can be that can be fully, yeah, fully automated, and they are so because I, I see this uh, I see this as uh, uh, we lived in the two D world, right? We 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 used to design houses and build houses with two D drawings, 
so in my mind that I always saw that and use as using 2d to build a 3d house right and then for in my and then Bin came and say no you're going to model immediately in 3d but we are going to automate 2d so you model in 3d and we automatically generate sections and plans yes. for you and yes. lists of windows and that's yes. all automated because there's information and then in my that, that's for me just a step that we have to go over because now you're building in 3d but then you're translating it in 2d just in order to translate it back into a 3d into 3d yeah so, so, so of course you know we should be Yes, we should be able to go from 3D to 3D and eventually that will, that will happen. I just yeah. want to offer you an example of, 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 the, of why automation is also automatic. And this is not a perfect analogy. Like when you use Google Maps, you want to go from point A to point B. And the one parameter that Google Maps uses is the shortest amount of time. And then it gives you other possibilities. But then it takes you, you know, through some really ugly roads and highways and, and so on. And I want to have a version of Google Maps where I can say, take me through the most scenic and the most beautiful route. You know, like, I don't really care how long it's gonna take as long as it's, as it's beautiful. So That's a very, very good example. And so, I guess so, it's easier to execute in Calgary than in New Jersey, no? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes and no. It's like, you know, it's, it's but then, you know, there are so many subtleties to what one would say consider scenic. So, and it, it's, you know, it's tied to the subject of optimization as well. So information, optimization, automation, are all inter interrelated and each yeah. needs to be kind of qualified and defined uh, uh, very precisely. So yeah. I, I don't really consider them to be, to be, um, ends worth pursuing in themselves. So mm -hmm. optimization for the sake of optimization, automation for the sake of yeah. automation. And as I've kind of shared with my students, you know, sometimes the suboptimal is the most beautiful mm -hmm. solution. So I like to see that, I, I like to see the design itself being equal to optimization, but you're optimizing for beauty. Because in optimization, yeah, you, 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 you have this iterative process, you know, and it, it's the same as in design. You generate something, evaluate, reconsider generate which is what optimization does it's just with a different goal no it's it's uh, i had a student who did a thesis on multi-objective optimization so and design as you know is is never about optimizing along a single variable so of course, yeah. and as soon as you have more than two variables you start running into into trouble like three you can still somehow manage to find an optimal solution yeah. but when you get to three and beyond you are destined to work with something that is suboptimal yeah. for some of the variables, variables that you're trying and to. And also open. you're dealing with a variable called beauty, which we haven't defined. So, yes. so how do you No, but it? but to go back to the work of, of, of this um, student, uh, uh, Yasin Ashur is his name, is a, is a, from Egypt, an amazing guy. So uh, uh, he worked on, on um, creative optimization workflows. So in other words, how do you create uh, a workflow where uh, you are presented with alternatives and you get to pick the ones that you want to work with so you're shown what is the most optimal uh, what is the least optimal you can see the range in, in, in between and you can explore the solution space for the kind of different variables that you're interested in in optimizing so yeah. it, it b becomes this kind of exercise in qualitative judgment mm -hmm. where you see that this kind of alternative is presented and you get to pick between them mm -hmm intuitively oftentimes yeah. till you arrive into but your 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 decision making is actually informed by this automation so to yeah. speak that is running in the in the in, in, in the background and yeah, i that's, think that's probably how these computational tools will yeah. be deployed in, yeah. in this kind of creative optimization workflows that's usually how it's seen the ai will basically be an assistant that will give you a couple of choices and then you will let it optimize more, give you more choices, and then work in unison, so to speak. More than a couple of choices, because what, what, this, what, what, what Yasin designed was were actually two-dimensional uh, matrices of solutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it's like you have one axis this way, the other axis another way, and then you would have, mm -hmm. say, 100. You can specify what is the population you want to look at. You can say, just give me 9, which is 3 by 3. You can say mm -hmm. 4, or give me 100 that I can, I can look at yeah. and then you get to choose which one you want to work yeah. on. 
So let me uh, let me just shortly uh, um, jump back to the academia and uh, mm -hmm. ask you a, a question that, that I often think about. That especially now uh, valid with Corona and COVID uh, is are these online teachings and online lessons because now I, mm -hmm. everything is moving online and uh, a lot of universities have classes that are free for everyone to see online and so on. So in my mind, as we have more and more free classes, I was thinking for every single subject, there will be one or two optimal classes for the entire world. So whenever anyone wants to learn that subject, they will go to those one or two videos or one or two series or videos. Somehow I feel it will converge to that. And uh, even if that's not the case, even f forget that, <laughs> metaphor generally how do you see uh, the role of physical universities in the, uh, the in the world of uh, free youtube classes for everyone and so on? well just imagine yourself being 18 again you're starting a kind of your university education you still have to figure out who you are uh what do you want to do what are you really interested in so it's part of you know growing up and maturing and kind of socializing you know with your peers Mm -hmm. is part of that process of you know figuring out what to do again who you are and so on so um, i believe that much of uh, what we consider undergraduate education in in mm -hmm. say in the us uh, will remain in the kind of conventional physical set setting with the campuses mm -hmm. with perhaps 80 percent of the classes you know being done in a face-to-face -face fashion and 20 percent being done online and remote mm -hmm. At the graduate level, that is at the master's level, I expect the opposite to be the case, where 80% of what people do will be online and then 20% would have some face-to-face -face component. So that, uh, and the difference between the two is that the people who embark on graduate education actually know what they want to do. They know who you are. So typically these students are, are mature, you're in your mid-20s, you kind of figure out what you want to, uh, to do. Uh, and then you do not really need to be in the company uh, of, of, of others as you kind of pursue that educational uh, journey. So that's how I kind of see the, the world of academia kind of bifurcating between undergrad and, and grad uh, ed education. Mm -hmm. For some people, it can be 100% online and some people would kind of crave a kind of a community of people, you know, that they can work with so that they're in the same space at the same time. Uh, and I think this is what is going to distinguish educational institutions in the future, that some will specialize in providing that on campus, uh, a, a outstanding experience, mm -hmm. and some would focus on providing an outstanding experience online yeah. for those who cannot be in a particular space at a particular time. But do you think that because of that, the degree system will suffer? That the degrees will be devaluated or, or no? No, but, but I think this is, this is not something that, that is new. Uh, there is uh, something called micro-credentials. So like, you know, where you begin to kind of accumulate uh, the, the, the kind of formal acknowledgement of your mm -hmm. academic accomplishments. You complete... Mm -hmm. Uh, a module in a course, then you complete a course, then you complete a certificate. Then if you, com if you complete enough modules, you complete a course. If you com complete enough courses, you complete a certificate. If you complete enough certificates, you get a, let's say, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree and, and so on. So I would call that an, an aggregation of, mm -hmm. of, of credentials. And for some people, just having a certificate is enough. For some, just having that that course completed uh, is, mm -hmm. is enough. And I think the market now exists for people who just want to do a particular course. Let's say I want to learn something about machine learning. Mm -hmm. There are free courses on, on machine learning. Yeah. But then, you know, if I want to start digging deeper, I can then develop, a, get a certificate in, in, in AI. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah. okay, now I know a thing or two about AI, but I really now want to apply AI in the context of design. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should kind of find a program that will get to design with some, you know, mm -hmm. AI kind of knowledge that I've accumulated along the way and that may also have in their own program. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to ask you one more question about uh, the academia. This is a, a bit more of a loose question, but something I think about. So in the, once I finished my PhD, I uh, 
I worked in a couple of universities and so on and dwelled in it a bit. And then I tried to have my, my uh, I tried to sit on two seats, as we would say, a little, mm -hmm. try, be a little bit in the academia, a little bit in, in, the, in the practice. And in some moment, I realized that doesn't really work. I mean, this is my personal perspective. But I realized that as I am sitting eight hours a day and working on, on some projects and real life projects, someone that's uh, in a university that's maybe a teaching assistant or researcher, they are doing the same thing, uh, uh, writing papers, researching, publishing papers, and so on. And then I realized that the main points for getting jobs in academia are usually nowadays uh, research papers, the number of them, then uh, how many grants maybe did you get and so on. They're very much connected to the academia itself. And I had, had this feeling that people like me from the practice that could potentially teach students a lot of valuable things that, that uh, mm -hmm. a purely academia person does not know that are day-to-day -day things that we deal with uh, on, a, on a daily basis that are very specific and very interesting to know. I think that there is no uh, place for us to come horizontally, sort of speak, and and, uh, and 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 get a proper position. Do you feel that this is the case or not the case, or that it's university specific or, or so on? Because in my life, uh, like a year or two ago, I, I kind of gave up on academia. I realized that I can't I can't sit on both chairs, and I will stop applying for different positions and so on because I didn't get uh, any uh, uh, response, I mean, proper response. And, and I felt that although, you know, I, I have this uh, amazing experience that I could actually bring to the students and I, for example, I have uh, uh, online developer courses for Rhino, C Sharp, Rhino, C++ and so on. I'm trying to teach online, so to speak. And whenever I kind of tried to do that in a physical institution, I was not really given a pass, let's say. Do you, just a general uh, thoughts on that, maybe. Well, I, I faced kind of similar dilemmas like you did in early in my in my career. I first started as a consultant, uh, just your consultant, so to speak, you know, to to, to the firms, um, and I had some commissions that were boring but paid really well, and then I had some commissions that were not. They were interesting, but didn't kind of pay enough and so on. And then I discovered that I was, you know, nine out of 10 projects I was doing were not interesting. And, but they were taking a good chunk of my time. And then I thought, I don't want to spend my time in life, you know, working on uninteresting things. And then in academia, you know, you, there are subjects that you teach. And apparently these are the subjects that you are passionate about. But then nobody tells you what to research and what to write about. It's really up to you. Mm -hmm. So then, and, and I enjoy that degree of, of, of independence because in, in your consulting, you know, reality, mm -hmm. like you depend on the work that clients bring to you yeah. and you, you need to do that work, you know, for all sorts of reasons. So mm -hmm. you need to live, so you, yeah. you need to earn an income and, 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 and so on. And then after I started in academia, I still continued to do a bit of consulting. This was early in my career. And then at some point I gave up completely on consulting yeah. because again, you know, what I was doing uh, in, in the context of academia was infinitely more interesting because with students, you get to yeah. explore and experiment in the context of the studio. Then in your own research, you get to explore and experiment, you know, again, what interests you mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. So that's, that's what I, I, I I, I like the kind of the freedom mm -hmm. that that being in an academic context, you know, afforded. I should say more freedom yeah. in an academic context than what you would get in practice. So, so, but my general question is: Do you think that uh, that uh, that universities are generally a little bit closed for this, uh, or, or for for people from practice? Not necessarily, that? because there is something called outside professional activities. So, so in other words, you know, if you, if you're exceptional in what you do. Mm -hmm. And the work that you do gets recognized, you know, by the peers as being ex exceptional and so on. Yeah, I think yeah. it's perfectly fine. And there are people who kind of manage to navigate the two worlds, you know, very fluidly. Mm -hmm. They are rare, but they do exist. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and maybe hmm, it depends. Again, depends on the on the context. You know, here I'm thinking of Dennis Sheldon you know, who used to work for uh, Gary Technologies, was one of the key people, then mm -hmm. moved to Georgia Tech to 
uh, to lead a research center is now an RPI kind of leading a research center. So, so again, you can, as a specialist, like at some point you may say, okay, enough of this. I have a PhD and <laughs> now I want to kind of do some really super highly speculative stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Like, you know, that I can, like, because, you know, you get to apply for research funding, you get research funding, like if the proposal is interesting, yeah, yeah. Uh, has potential and, and so on, you get to work with stuff. I, I don't want to take any more of your time. I was just about to say that. Just yeah. wanted to, uh, just wanted to ask you again. So uh, about uh, about uh, Calgary, are you missing the, the nature there? Because I heard it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Oh, the, the, the mountains are absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's something that I'm missing now mm -hmm. because it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful landscape uh, and nature there is just awesome. If I can kind of sum, sum it up in, 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 in one word. It's, it's a very powerful sensation to be in that context. So, yeah. uh, and, and again, it's something that I appreciated very much while I was, I was there. So. Thank you. Thank you very much for talking to me. Hey, I find pleasure. It Anytime, Milos. Very interesting, Milosh. and we so. can do it again some other time. Yes. Yeah. Best of luck in your path. So. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Sure. Bye-bye.